Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, where I open my mail. Awesome, let's get straight into it. This one's from Ryan Clark. He's from, um, I, I presume it's um, Ontario in Canada. So hi to all my Canadian viewers. And let's, uh, doesn't have one of those pool tabby things. Nope, let's rip it apart. Um, and I do believe this one is time sensitive. You know what that means. Let's have a... What? Woohoo! We've got lots of little goodies. Lots of little boards. It's called the Jig Mod. Let's check it out. Got a nice looking breadboard base and there's a letter. Let's read it. Thank you for being awesome. No worries. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it's a jig mod. It's a Kickstarter. Let's check it out. So this is Ryan's Kickstarter project he's got. There's only, like, as I shoot this, there's only two days left. So by the time I upload this video, there'll probably only be a day left. So if you want one, you better damn well hurry. And he's almost uh, there on his very modest goal. And what it is, well, it's pretty obvious just by looking at it. It's a basic uh, breadboard stuck on a uh, Perspex frame here mounted. In fact, it's uh, there's like a secondary uh, plate on there. Um, and it's just double-sided stuck down. I'm not sure why it's not peeled back there. I guess you've got to peel it back yourself. I'm not sure what the uh, intent there is. It, anyway, you can stick that down and you can replace it. So you can leave all of these things intact. And um, he hasn't included a whole bunch of these uh, mod boards. Now it comes in uh, three different sizes, just your standard one breadboard with just one uh, row of places to put your jig mods. I'll explain what they do in a second. And then a mid-range one, and then this is the XL model with uh, two slots up here where you can mount all these jig mod boards. And what these jig mod boards are is exactly what they look like. Just um, interfaces to different things. Either uh, in this case, we've got ourselves a joystick on a board like this, and we can mount these in these various holes using all these uh, standoffs, and we can even um, stagger them up like this. We don't have to have just one layer of these things. And it just allows you to easily interface um, things like this rocker switch, for example, onto your breadboard, or like this 3.5mm uh, phono jack, for example. How do you hook one of these things up? If you design your circuit, it, just interfacing to stuff can be a pain in the ass, and this what is what this thing solves. So what we've got here is these little uh, brass standoffs of various uh, sizes, and we've got tapped holes down in the perspex down in here, and we can just screw those on, and then we can just sit our board on top and then screw it in and bingo. And then the uh, half moon arrangement here, we've got uh, castellation uh, pads here. We can just mount another one there so we don't have to, we can butt them right up against each other and then just screw those on. It's rather a nice design, I like it. And then you can even stack them like that as high as you want, as many as you want using different length standoffs. And then just get in here with your wires and bingo jump of them over to your breadboard. Beautiful interface design. I like it. And then the interface is just these uh, push terminals that you just uh, insert your regular breadboard wires on and bingo, you can plug those into your breadboard. So you've got a very nice rigid and foolproof way to interface all different things onto your breadboard circuit. Now I know some of you might thinking, well that's nice, but you know, what's the big deal? Well, it can be a real big deal if you're trying to uh, develop something, for example, that you're going to show off to, uh, you know, some venture capitalists, or you're going to show off, you know, something, you're going to take it to the maker fair, you've built it up on breadboard, you just got it finished at the last second, you didn't have time to build it on a PCB prototype, and you want to demo something in a hurry, then, well, yeah, I've seen it time and time again at maker uh, fairs, well, two of them that I've been to, people have built something up on the breadboard, and they got wires hanging off, and it's absolutely atrocious, whereas you've got something like this, it looks very, very professional, and it's unlikely that any Anything's going to break. You can muck around with all your interfaces and you can plug some headphones or whatever into here and you can uh, have external permanent wiring coming off here. You can maybe add in, uh, you know, it's got like a little uh, proto board module here. You could wire uh, some stuff in there permanently if you needed to and interface to your breadboard. So this is streets ahead of just, you know, using the breadboard on its own and then just having everything hanging off. It's just, 
it's so professional. You could actually show this to some venture capitalists and, you know, proof of concept uh, kind of thing. And it wouldn't look, well, you know, it'd be better if you had it on a proper PCB and everything else, but it certainly looks professional. Now, Ryan's actually got a dozen or more, I think, of these uh, Jigmod boards for various types of interfaces and stuff like that. He's only sent me a few, so I'm not sure why, but uh, anyway, it's just, it's quite representative of this thing. And of course, you could make your own uh, Jigmod mod boards as well if you wanted to, you know, lash up. You know, if you're serious about developing your prototypes and you don't just want it ugly, but you still want the flexibility of using a breadboard, then this thing's got winner written all over it. And as with all these things, if you need it, you need it. If you don't have it, you don't have it, and you're stuck either rolling your own or just messily have the wires just hanging off your breadboard. So uh, the best example, like I'll um, whack up some photos here that uh, Ryan's got on his uh, Kickstarter campaign, which, you know, shows it a bit uh, better because you know, it's not much I can do here with these uh, limited boards unless I build up uh, something. But... Yeah, anyway, that's winner, winner, chicken dinner. So check out Ryan's uh, Kickstarter campaign, which like ends literally in a day or so. So get on it if you want one of these jig mods. Thanks, Ryan. Next up, one from China from Lumen Top Technology. And uh, they make, well, you can probably guess by the name, Lumen. I think I can see through that. Um, so they make, obviously, <laughs> love it. Um, so let's... Um, there we go. That's the way to open it. Did I? No, I didn't bugger anything. Ta-da! We've got a AAA flashlight or a keyring flashlight. I like these. Um, I'll show you my everyday carry light and we'll see how this puppy compares. Mmm. Ooh, yeah, baby. Has it got a... Uh, no, no battery in it. Let's check it out. So here's this Lumen Top AAA flashlight, and no, it's not a uh, one hung low. Lumen Top uh, do seem to produce some uh, a whole bunch of uh, quality products, and well, there's the specs for those playing along at home. This thing really does the business. It uses a Cree uh, XPG2R5 LED. It's got three different modes, as we'll take a look at. Well, look, 110 lumens uh, from for the 30 minutes uh, runtime. I'm not sure if that's fully regulated or not, uh, but, uh, well, I won't be able to run the test here. This is only just an overview. And uh, up to 60 hours, so 32 and 5 lumens as well to get you out of trouble. So that streets ahead of my everyday carry I uh, have at the moment. I'll show you that in a minute. Full are uh, waterproof and runs off a single AAA battery. It's brilliant. So let's take a look at this puppy. And by the way, this thing is only 20 bucks on Amazon, which is very nice. That feels like it's built like a brick dunny, and uh, it should be. It's, you know, aircraft uh, grade aluminium and all the rest of it. And uh, it's got a belt clip uh, attachment here, which I don't use because I don't have it on my belt. I put it on my uh, keychain. And that's, uh, hang on, that's one thing I don't think it came with. We've got some spare O-rings, but it doesn't have a keychain. Um, I mean, it's got the uh, points in there for the keychain uh, ring to go on. But look at, down in there, you've got to wedge it between the switch. Anyway, this thing, one of the big features is that it does actually have a tail cap switch. And that's quite a novel feature, actually, to have a tail cap switch on a keychain AAA torch like this. Yeah, none of this flashlight rubbish, uh, you Yanks call them. It's a torch here in Australia. And the top part uh, turns off. There's the, the regulation uh, and driver circuit will be in there. That looks decent. And interestingly, the other end screws off as well. So there's the bottom uh, tail cap. So that's that's rather interesting that both of them come off. Now, if we can compare it to my everyday carry keychain torch here, this is a uh, through night one, and uh, it's the TI model. I think there's a, a like a later version TI something or other, but this is original TI, only 60 lumens. This puppy will do 110 lumens. Absolutely brilliant. But as you can see, it is significantly uh, longer, and it's a twist top uh, turn on and off. Uh, no uh, tail cap switch on it and sometimes it's occasionally switched on but quite rare because it is reasonably stiff and it's got two different uh, modes as well it's got just the low and which i think is like five or ten lumens very similar to this one and then it goes up to full 60 lumens when you turn it on high but uh yeah it's a little bit longer than that it's 
probably all my practically identical, I think, diameter. But uh, yeah, this one feels like the duck's guts. And with these keychain torches, I do recommend the uh, lithium batteries like this. They're just, you know, well, they're lighter and they are uh, got much better uh, performance. That fit, it's not a tight, it's not a tight fit. There is a little bit of a, little bit of play in there, but uh, that's nothing as long as it uh, compresses well enough. Now this has two options for turning on. One is the tail cap, as you're familiar with. So, look. So it's actually, you've got to do two things to switch it on. You can switch it on with just the tail cap if, you're, uh, if you leave the switch on, or you can just use the switch. Very nice, and it's got different modes while you're on there. You just don't push it all the way. And you can see the three different modes there. Low, medium, well, medium and high. Nice. And it only weighs 15 grams too, which is bugger all. But one thing I really like about this is that you switch it on and it doesn't immediately go to the high mode. And, you know, waste battery, blind you, whatever. Um, you know, waste the charge. It'll go to medium mode. So switch it on. It's medium. And then touch it. You go to low, touch it again, and then we're on high. Nice. I don't want to switch it on always and immediately go to the high mode. So that's a very sensible choice. I really like that. Someone was thinking. Okay, this won't be a fantastically scientific uh, test. I can't get the uh, lab completely dark here because of the lights outside. But uh, this is my through night one. So this is 60 lumens. I do have a new battery in it. There we go. That's what the 60 lumens looks like on the through night. And I've got the exactly the same exposure, so I don't have auto exposure on the camera. And here is the lumen top. This is in medium mode. So much broader pattern. I like that. Look at the broad pattern on that compared to the, so I think it's more a bit spot focused on the uh, through night one. But let's go back to the lumen top. So that's uh, medium. What's that? 32 lumens. So yeah, that was about on par because we were 60 lumens before. And then we're looking at the low mode, which doesn't do much at all. It's only five lumens, but hey, it'll get you out of trouble. That's the whole thing with it. You know, in the middle of the night, you can still, you know, probably do most things with that. And here we go. And there we go. That's the brightest mode. So that's 110 lumens. And wow, it's a really broad angle. You can't see it here, but it is broader than the through night one. So there it is, 110 lumens, and that's very, very nice. So 32 and 5. As I mentioned before, the only real problem I have with that is that when you put a put it on the key ring, I've got a large, this is the one I use for mine, and it's quite large to attach to my key ring because I like um, getting my, being able to get in my finger there, and that's what I use to carry my key ring, you know, my keys like that. So, uh, yeah, it, it the button just gets in the way. So that's a bit annoying, if anything. But yeah, verdict is still out on that. I'll let you know when I've uh, had this on my uh, key ring for a month or so. But I really like that. So I'm going to replace my uh, through night one. Even though it is a fraction longer, I like the uh, tail cap on it. And it's actually got two inner locks, uh, by the way. Um, you know, you I can't turn that on yet. And if I screw that, I still can't turn it on because I then have to screw that one. So you can actually have two inner locks and turn it off or on by either the tail cap or the front of that thing or the switch. So, you know, really, if you loosen those like that, there's no way this is accidentally coming on in your pocket if you bump that button. So thanks to Lumen Top for sending that one in. That one is available, uh, it's slightly over 20 bucks, but it's like on special on Amazon at the moment for 20 bucks. So I'll link it in down below. You should, everyone should have one of these, uh, especially engineers should have an everyday carry flashlight. This your f little stupid lead in your phone doesn't cut the mustard. You need a real torch like this puppy. So yeah, that's very nice. I'll let you know, I might give you an update in a month or so after I've uh, used it, because I use my one all the time on my, uh, like you can see, it's just had the crap worn out of it. Look at it, it's just like, <laughs> it's had the, look. Man, you know, there's hardly any left. I think the keychain thing's almost worn through on this puppy. So I don't know, what have I had that on, two years or something? But yeah, it's not much of the knurling left. It's all, it's all pretty smoothed out.
So there you go. Ask me for an update in a month or so, but I like that. Whoa, that's my new everyday carry. Next up, one from Australia. This one's from uh, Nick. Thank you very much, Nick. He's from uh, South Australia. And uh, lovely part of the country, South Australia. It's a little bit sleepy. Um, I got... <laughs> I got it. Well, Adelaide. I'm talking about Adelaide. He's not from... I don't think he's from Adelaide. Uh, no, he's from... Uh, so, what is it? Yes. Plumpton. Plimpton? Something like that. I presume South Plimpton. Jeez. This is not pretty, is it? This is not pretty at all. Hang on. There we go. Bob's your uncle. What do we got? Looks like we've got some old stuff. We've got... Ah, oh, Kyocera. No, it's in a Canon case, but it's a Kyocera 3.3 megapixel camera. Wow. Ancient puppy. Jeez, look at that. A tiny screen on it. But those were the days. And what's this? A, it, it's a light with a... It's okay. It's a, yeah, all right. It's got a light on it. It's got... I have no idea. What? Yeah, reset volume. It's not like an FM radio or something, is it? I've got no idea. Let's read the note. So Nick is sending this very old school uh, Kyocera Fine Cam S3. Did anyone have one of these? A whopping 3.3 megapixels. Hey, that's more than my first uh, digital camera. And two times optical zoom. Hey, at least it had some optical zoom. That's, you know, look at it. Oh my goodness. But hey, used, you know, state-of-the-art SD card. Bloody ripper. And what's that got? Like one and a half inch display. Oh, what a bobby dazzler. Oh. Do I see a light there? Oh! Oh, it works! Whoop! Oh, look at that! Oh, it's erect! And, well, can we take a photo? Might be a bit much for a two-minute teardown, I think. Um, but I do have a couple of other um, old-school cameras. I might uh, whip them all apart at the same time. What did it... What did it use? Oh, some little custom thing. Yep. Mm. Nick supplied the plug pack for this puppy, so... That's not the fastest thing. Wow. Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. It still works. What a bobby dazzler. No, it doesn't like the card. Listen to that. <laughs> wow, that's the, got like the loudest focus and everything system. I've ever heard. That is awful whiny noise in the motors. Anyway, doesn't like the um, SD card I format. I thought it might be FAT32, so I format it in FAT, but it's a 4 gig card, and it doesn't like it. And the other thing Nick has sent in is actually, yes, it is a radio, but it's a wind-up radio. Look at this. So, how do we... Here we go. Can we... No. Right, there we go. Lift it up. There we go. See if you can hear that. Oh, got some static, got a birdie. Picked up a birdie. No, that was just a battery going. Kind of, sort of works, I guess, if you're desperate. Scan. Getting something. Come on. Oh, And you know it's a fail when you've got to have external plug packs here. What's this? Like 6 volts, 5.4. What the? What the hell's going on there? But anyway, they can't seem to get the LED lights on the front working. Ah, oh, jeez. What a fail. Two minute teardown. And we're in like Flynn. And well, there's our <laughs> reduction gear mechanism. Look at that. But yeah, I mean, like, is there, yeah, there's got to be battery storage under there somewhere, or is it going to be a uh, super cap? We'll see, but yeah, that's pretty crusty. Oh, yeah, this thing has seen better days. Eh, leaky. Yep, no wonder she ain't working, but yep, look at that. <laughs> Not much doing, they've just got an FM uh, tuner there, and uh, 
some probably uh, nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries and Bob's your uncle. Ah, oh, it's just uh, awful. Well, let's see what we can get on this heap of crap, shall we? I'll try and uh, wind it. We've got uh, two volts uh, per division here. And two volts, you wind it slowly, getting some ripple on there. Ta-da! And there we go, your ripple frequency increases, of course, as you uh, do it higher and higher. But the two, four, six, you know, eh, so that's a product fail right there. I mean, you know, you're supposed to, like, uh, have these things for, like, emergency use and stuff like that. And, well, you know, I wouldn't have it sitting there, you know, five, ten years in the shed if the power fails or on your boat or wherever you're, you know, some remote location or something. You know, it, like, the batteries are just going to be cactus before then. It's just, ah, uh, it's garbage. Thanks, Nick. Next up, we've got one from, I don't know if this is a first or not, uh, but we've got one from, uh, I believe, his name is uh, Guana Giolova. Sorry, pronouncing that incorrectly. Anyway, it was from a country I had, like, never heard of. Um, Latuva. And I had to go look it up. And that's actually, um, I think it's like the local uh, spelling for Lithuania. So why are all my Lithuanian viewers? I'm not sure if we've had anything from Lithuania before. So, yeah, here it is. Lithuania. Um, that's, their, that's their post office. There you go. Well, oh, that's their postal, uh, postal service. So there you go. Lithuania. Awesome. I wonder how many viewers I've got in Lithuania. Fantastic. Ah, uh, one day I'll travel the world again. When you got kids, nah, doesn't happen. This one's um. Let's have a look. Let's let's see what. Not quite sure what's going on here. Yes, I'm cutting towards myself. I know precisely what I'm doing. It's okay. You OHS paranoid people. It really, it's okay. I'm not going to cut myself, really. Jeez. Ugh. I can smell something. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Are you kidding me? We have, I presume, they're like. Mm, probably like chocolatey caramel kind of things. A whole bag of them. Yet another bag of... Um, I don't know. I'll have to look at them. Holy crap, another one. Holy crap. Look at this. Oh, anyone can read that? Sorry, I can't. I have no idea. Chocolate collection. Some sort of chocolate collection. Awesome. Thank you very much. Jeez. Try to lose a bit of weight, you know. And yes, we actually have some hardware. It's okay. Oh, okay. We have. Oh, look at that. Ta da! Wow. Sony Video 8 Handycam. Awesome. Thank you very much. That is a uh, that is a retro teardown right there. That's definitely not a two minute teardown. And that will be retro. It's got all the accessories. It's got the flash and. Uh, it's got the whole kit and caboodle. We even have, ta-da, a um, Video 8 cassette as well. Fantastic. Oh, and the remote, it's got the whole works. Oh, it, it's in the box. Duh, should have even looked at the box. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's a couple of loose chocolates in the bottom. Oh. Beautiful. And this one's from Vlad. Greetings, Dave. Thank you for teaching me my soldering has been a lie my entire life. No worries. Hope this 1992 Sony Handycam is worth a two-minute teardown. Oh, it's worth a bit more than that. You know I love uh, retro teardowns. Thank you very much, Vlad. P.S. Be careful with the gor gorillas. Is that correct? Candy? And has a hard, solid core. Yeah, don't want to bust the old teeth. They're the only set I got. Check it out, 1992 Video 8 Handycam. We've got the original uh, operational manual for it as well. Um, yeah, uh, Video 8, of course, not that uh, VHS uh, rubbish or uh, uh, DV. We've got the original remote control for it. We've got the flash. We've got the uh, battery charger for it. We've got everything. Fantastic. What the... 
Jeez, what's, oh, that's a eliminator type thing. Wow. Did anyone have one of these puppies back in the day? Oh, maybe I can shoot my next blog with it. What do you think? Hi-Fi stereo, you bloody ripper. Oh, autofocus, got all the mod cons. Look, LCD for um, status and stuff like that, runtime. Oh, man, it's got everything. Look at the viewfinder. Oh. Beautiful. That'll have one of those uh, micro um, CRTs in it. They're very, very nice. So uh, hopefully we can do a retro teardown of this vintage Video 8 Handycam. Thank you very much, Vlad. And I think it's time for me to indulge in some... Whoa, look at these. Oh, <gasps> oh yes. And bags and bags of... I presume... Are they the little candy rock hard... Ugh. Damn, they're hard. And these are, uh, no, they're all, uh, oh, no, they're squishable. These ones aren't. Jeez, they're rock hard as well. But, uh, whoa, who's that dude? I don't know. I can't read any of it. I'm sure he makes good chocolate. Let's find out. Let's have a look. Oh, I, sorry, I can't read it. Someone translate. Oh, look at these. Mm. <gasps> See ya. Thanks, Vlad. Mm, very nice. Next up, one from the United States of America. America. I don't want my American viewers. I don't want my Yankee viewers. About, I don't know, what is it, 25% or something of my viewers are uh, American? It, it is not the majority, um, but it is, yeah, like a quarter, because the world is a big place, even though, um, yes, the largest percentage of viewers is in the US, um, but, oh, can't quite get the slot there, there we go, um, but yes, not, certainly not the majority, so, there you go, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ronald Bryant. Good on you, Ronald. He's from Kelowna in Illinois. Um, I don't think I said that, did I? No. Still haven't got one from Shermer, Illinois, though. Damn it. There's been quite a few Illinois ones lately, hasn't there? So thank you very much, Ronald. We have a note. And, uh, do do do. Oh, you asked for a mailbag from Shermer, Illinois. Well, here it is. Right, I'll have to, uh, I'll show you this. I'll show you this. Oh, no way! Oh, gold. Thank you very much. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. Look. Look at this. So is what's in the box, by the way. Ta-da! I got one better than one from Sherman, Illinois. I got a Sherman, Illinois t-shirt. Beauty. Good on you, Ronald. He is from Shermer, Illinois. <laughs> I asked for a mailbag. Well, here it is, a fluke scope meter. John Bender stole it from shop class. Well, yeah, that's typical. And he would have liked to have sent Molly Ringwald or Ali Sheedy for a teardown Tuesday, but at $12 a pound for shipping, he couldn't afford it. Oh, I was, yep, I was an Ali Sheedy fanboy. After all, she, not only Brat Packer, but she was in war games. So, yep, it's got to be Ali Sheedy. <laughs> and here's the plug pack for this scope meter. Look at this. It's got one of these evil center negative pins. Unbelievable. Urgh, evil. Check out this Fluke 196 scope meter. What a dumpster find. Hi. There we go. Nice mirrored screen. Can't see anything. Um, 100 megahertz, one gig sample per second. Uh, two isolated channels, multimeter. Can't believe... That was in the dumpster, and apparently it just wouldn't hold a charge. Two problems, A, wouldn't hold a charge, and B, um, had some horizontal lines on the screen. So let's see if we can power the puppy up. He has removed the battery, apparently. So anyway, made in Holland. I don't want all my Netherlands viewers. Or Holland viewers? Hmm, that's a bit old school. Actually, offhand, I'm not sure how to get into the... Uh battery pack for this thing. Maybe you take the uh, this hole back off here. I've taken the uh, this front off. It's just got two screws in there and we can see the uh, look, they've got uh, o-ring seals around there around all the uh, 
looks like around the BNCs and the multimeter plugs. That's very nice. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, it's not like the C cells batteries I had in the uh, previous uh, Fluke scope meter. Take those two off, and maybe she'll pop off. Hmm. And ta-da, we're in like Flynn, and it looks like you have to to get to the battery. There you go, Fluke BP190 battery. So we've got some shields all around there. I don't know if I should do a uh, do a tear down or not. No. See if I can power it up though. And as I've said in a previous video, if you're trying to power up uh, an unknown uh, device like this and you're not sure uh, whether it's sent a positive or whether it's sent a negative pain in the ass like this one, well, and you don't know what the label, the pins are labeled and all that sort of jazz, it's easy. Go for the metal shield, continuity tester, and bingo, it's that pin there, which is the positive one, which is, yep, sent a negative. And it's not the other one. Just a little tip. And there we go, I've powered it up, and uh, sure enough... Yep, look at those horizontal lines. Hmm, well, maybe we can do a repair video. So thank you very much, Ronald, for sending that one in. It's a Bobby Dazzler, and we'll uh, certainly attempt a repair video on that. And just remember, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. Thanks, Ronald. Next up, we've got one from, once again, another country you may not have had before, Israel. Um, hi there, Dave uh, Falston, if that's how you pronounce it. Thank you very much. He's from uh, Jerusalem in Israel. So, hi to all my Israeli viewers. I'm not sure how many there are, but Israel is, if you don't know, a huge, one of the leading technical powers in the world in, in terms of uh, technical innovation and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, Doc Brown might think all the best stuff's made in Japan, but I think all the uh, all the best stuff is developed in Israel. So yeah, they they punch massively above their weight um, in terms of uh, technical development and uh, Nobel prizes and you know everything else. So yeah, Israel, oh, man, they really know their stuff in Israel. So what do we got here? Let's have a squeeze. We do have. I think there's a note. There we go. There's Jerusalem Tower of David. I've got my own tower. Awesome. Beautiful. Hi Dave. Now he's an IT professional from Israel. Thought he's not an electronics engineer. He does enjoy it though. This orange thingy. We have an orange thingy. Yes. Okay. It's checkpoint. It's a safe office checkpoint. I have no idea. Let's read it. It's a um, the biggest network security company in the world. They are for, founded by former Israeli Defense Force intelligence officers, um, responsible for collecting signal intelligence and all that sort of jazz. And Dave actually took this fantastic photo of the Tower of David in Jerusalem. There you go. Great shot, Dave. So let's check out this checkpoint device. Yeah, I've never heard of uh, checkpoint, but I'm not into. I'm, well, I'm not in the game of this sort of stuff, so let's have a look inside the thing. Quick, two minute, tear down. Ta-da! And there it is. The uh, metal case just uh, slides off. None of this plastic rubbish. No sorry, Bob. Um, very nice. We've got ourselves battery backup down in there. Huge, big, uh, thin heatsink down here on uh, presumably some sort of uh, custom job. And another heatsink up there. But yeah, apart from that, we've got some flash memory underneath there. And... Uh, yeah, now it's got a firmware sticker, so that's got to be the flash memory. Well, not much else. It's got, you know, this will be our network uh, port adapter up here, and but this will be all the um, uh, security and whatnot um, inside here. And although I might be able to get uh, this heatsink off this uh, presumably ASIC down in here by uh, maybe heating it up, I'm curious to know, because we don't want to use this thing, it's like, yep, yeah, that's a... Two minute teardown. I'm curious to know what happens if I try and eh, eh, get in there with the uh, screwdriver and go a bit medieval on its ass. Let's find out. This could be ugly. This could be really ugly. Oh, oh the BGA's gone. Oh, what do we got? What do we got? Did we rip the whole BGA off? What's no? Oh, yes. Top cap. Gonski. Oh, look at that. Wow. Now that's interesting. Look, we've got like a mesh and a coil. Have we got some 
silicon protection mechanism, perhaps. Wow, some like, you know, so that you can't tamper with the thing. Why have we got what looks like a coil in there? That is fascinating. Hmm. Wow, look at that. I'm not sure of the various uh, security and other layers in here. If people know exactly what's going on inside this puppy, then uh, please let us know because... I'm not, uh, I'm not up on, uh, chip physical security and stuff like that, but, yeah, looks like they got some serious business happening. And that looks like the fiberglass weave, perhaps. So, have they got, like, a, uh, have they got that coil there embedded in that fiberglass board because you know the stand regular board you know a uh, regular pcb material is uh fiberglass and it's usually uh woven quite like that but like why have we got our strips going around like that some sort of security intrusion mechanism that's all i can that's all i can figure it's all i can figure wow it ain't just a bare die and a couple of bond wires, that's for sure. Just check out all the different layers happening in there. This is one complicated beast. Hmm. Look at those vias right down in there. Then have we got... Is this like a conductive layer, is it? What the hell is going on? So I have definitely confirmed that that is a uh, copper layer there. So what we may have done is ripped open a standard, well, not standard, but basically a, uh, a fiberglass board. The die is on the, um, stuck to the heatsink, but, jeez, oh, I don't know. They're, I think they're serious about not letting people into this thing. And well, because we've already destroyed that, just for kicks, let's take this one off. Although I suspect this is, it's not, uh, yep, yeah, that's not the same. See, <laughs> it's not the same business. We've just gotten off the shelf. Uh, Chip said, I don't know who's Big M. Is that like a Marvel or something? I don't know. But that that looks just like an off the shelf uh, Ethernet uh, interface. And I just checked in. Yep, sure enough, that's a Marvel um, gigabit Ethernet transceiver. But you can see the difference. You know, your standard quad flat pack package, how we just, you know, that thermal adhesive, okay, it's, yeah, it's pretty strong, but it just popped off because all of the encapsulated chip was strong enough to stay together, but this puppy was, you know, you can tell it, it wasn't just extra strong glue on there, it was designed to really be secure in some way, shape, or form, I'm sure of it, so... If anyone has any details on that, yeah, please leave it in the comments. So thank you very much, Dave, for uh, sending that one in. I think he actually wanted me to troubleshoot it. Oops. Sorry, Dave. Um, no, I think this is much more fascinating, just ripping it apart. Oh, what a Bobby Dazzler. Look at that. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for sending uh, something to today's mailbag. And sorry if I haven't gotten around to your mailbag stuff yet. There's still plenty of stuff left on the shelf, and I do kind of just sort of pick them at random. The bigger ones sort of get more interesting. So sorry if I'll eventually get around to them though. Anyway, if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV blog forum. Links for all the stuff shown in the video, always down below or up above or wherever, depending on the source you're watching this from. Catch you next time.